Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Meet the Author session from the Non-Religion in a Complex Future project. My name is Lauren Strumos. I'm the student caucus leader for the project and also the moderator for this webinar series. Um, this webinar today is going to deviate a little from the usual format of our Meet the Author sessions. Um, so first and following introductions, we're going to hear um, a presentation from our featured authors on their very important book and research that brought us all here today. Um, second, Lori Beeman, Principal Investigator of the Non-Religion and a Complex Future Project, will make a few comments. And then third, we'll hear from each of our panelists. This will then lastly be followed um, by a Q&A session and more instructions on how to ask your questions will be provided later. Um, and at this point too, I just want to um, give a friendly reminder to everyone to please make sure your audio is muted um, for these portions of the session. So I now have the pleasure of introducing our authors of this Meet the Author session, Brian Clark and Stuart McDonald, as well as our panelists, Callum Brown, Christine Mitchell, and Peter Beyer. Brian Clark is a social historian of Christianity. His previous research examined the role of gender and ethnicity in the creation of religious identities and in the formation of public religion in Victorian Canada. More recently, in collaboration with Stuart MacDonald, he is studying the growing trend of disaffiliation from organized Christianity in Canada from the 1960s through to the 21st century. He is also co-author with Stuart MacDonald of Leaving Christianity, Changing Allegiances in Canada Since 1945, which was published in 2017 by McGill Queen's University Press and is of course serving as the focus for the session today. Stuart MacDonald currently serves as Professor of Church and Society at Knox College at the Toronto School of Theology, University of Toronto. His research has involved investigating witchcraft accusations in 17th century Scotland including the book, The Witches of Fife, as well as studying Christianity in 20th century Canada. His current research project is focused on the history of the Presbyterian Church in Canada in the period from 1945 to 1985, with a particular interest in how this denomination built new congregations in Canada suburbs in this period. Callum Brown is a professor of late modern European history at the University of Glasgow. He is a social and cultural historian specializing in the period from 1750 to present times, and he is well known for arguing that the cultural changes of the 1960s played a key role in the decline of the churches and for his critique of the secularization thesis. He is the author of The Death of Christian Britain, Becoming Atheist, and The Battle for Christian Britain. Christine Mitchell is professor of Hebrew scriptures at St. Andrews College an adjunct member of the College of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at the University of Saskatchewan. She has written and presented widely on topics such as the Biblical Books of Chronicles, Religion in the Ancient Persian Empire, the Bible and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and Feminist and Gender Study Approaches to Biblical Text. She is the inaugural editor of the Advancing Studies in Religion series at McGill Queen's University Press, which again published the book Leaving Christianity. Peter Beyer is Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa. His research areas include religion and globalization, sociological theory of religion, religion and migration, and religion in contemporary Canada. His publications include Religions and Global Society, Religion in the Context of Globalization, and Growing Up Canadian, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists. His current research is on religious and non-religious identity and their tra transmission in contemporary global society. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. And now, Brian and Stuart, without further ado, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, let me begin uh, by thanking you for inviting us to be here. It's a real pleasure. And also to uh, just thank my co-author, Brian Clark. This book was very much a co-authored project from beginning to end. And uh, I, I really appreciate it, all that he has done as part of that. Let me begin by something basic. Why did we begin to research and write this book? Something really fundamental. Uh, we each had individual research projects we were working on when we began this, but we realized that uh, we were seeing in our research as well as around in our teaching and our lives, what we were seeing didn't fit the portrait of religion in Canada 
that was being presented. And this was particularly evident and came into sharp focus when the results of the religion question in the 20, 2001 census were released in 2003. The headlines basically said nothing's changed. And the papers and TV were suggesting there was nothing dramatic in the results of the census. And yet there was. We saw that at a glance. Those claiming no religion were now 16%. There was a story here. Uh, we didn't feel it was being told. And so that's really how we uh, began, began working on this book. Um, and so as you know, what we argued was that Christianity in Canada was alive and well into the 1950s, into the 60s, through all of the branches. And that the 1960s saw a short, sharp change. And that everything we're seeing now has its origins in that transition. This argument was very much in line with some scholars, notably Callum Brown and Hugh McLeod. At the same time, it went against the general trend of secularization theory, which argued for a long-term decline in the West, including Canada, and also against rational choice theories. And both of these theories have remained remarkably I'm not sure I would use the uh, word resilient. I would probably show my bias and use the word stubborn. Uh, they just keep going, um, but that's clearly my bias because we disagree with both of these in the book and we try to give the evidence to suggest why we think uh, there's a completely different story, which is what we try to tell in the book. Uh, so that's really uh, what we were trying to do in the book the 1960s become this really important hinge decade. Um, since the book was published, as you heard at the beginning, I've gone back to working on a very traditional historical project on what I'd put on hold uh, while Brian and I worked on the book. And I, indeed, I'd go further. It was really necessary to do this book in order to make sense of what I was seeing in the denominational data. And now that I have, that we have this book out, now that we have that big picture framed, what we're seeing makes more sense. Uh, I'm not always having to say, this doesn't fit what everyone else is saying. And so what is striking as I look at the Presbyterian Church in Canada, a particular denomination from 1945 to 1985, what is striking is how confident Canadian Presbyterians were, how successful they were. Uh, when I look at them building new congregations, they weren't, these things were going up and being filled before they filled, before they'd actually built them. They started a congregation, it filled up. How clear the vision was. The leadership of the Presbyterian Church in Canada was confidently attempting to be the reformed voice in Canada and bring into their fold all of the immigrants of that heritage, as well as anyone else who was interested who came to Canada. So they really focused on these things. Um, they were not a, pres a Scottish ghetto. Uh, at the General Assembly, you were as likely, in fact, more likely in this period, the early period, to see Hungarian and Ukrainian folk costumes than any Scottish folk costumes. So, Put simply, what the research is doing is fleshing out the numbers uh, in the book. It's giving us pictures and stories that give different dimensions to the story that Brian and I tell in Leaving Christianity. Religious vitality that suddenly didn't work the same way anymore. One thing I might want to emphasize more than we did in the book, and this has only become clear as, I, as, as I've been working on this, might be the links between the anti-communism and the religious revival of the 1950s in Canada. It seems to me uh, it was all of one package, and that's something I've, I'm, I'm thinking through at the moment. Uh, but another thing I would just note is the theological voice that dominates in the Canadian Presbyterian Church is actually the neo-Orthodox voice. Uh, and it's also clear how traditional the Presbyterian Church in Canada is. There are a few voices that looking back, we now see as somehow reformist, but they're very much a minority. 
Uh, so this is a fairly traditional establishment denomination. Everything's working for them until it isn't. Uh, one of the things that I've also discovered is a key moment of pushback that I think is fascinating, that in the late 70s, all of a sudden, there is this movement against what people, one wing of the church, sees as unhelpful in the church's evolution in the 1960s. And so they start to push back. And it's really fascinating to see the coordination and their work to do that. Uh, and what galvanized the first opposition was their um, objections to the World Council of Churches program to combat racism. And so that comes even before uh, the, re the attempt to rethink the ordination of women that had been decided in the, in the 1960s. So um, those are the key themes of the book. And I think for one thing, for those who are working on non-religion in Canada and a complex future, I think one of the things to note is the vitality uh, in that period. I think that's just something we need to take, uh, take seriously, as well as taking seriously the change from that since then. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting messages on my screen that I shouldn't be getting. Um, Strip began basically where I uh, was thinking of starting my, my comments, uh, which goes back to the 2001 census, because um, this project began when Stuart started examining the demographic profile uh, for people who had no religion uh, in 2001. Um, and back in 2003, when the, these results were released, the, the conventional story uh, at the time, the conventional wisdom, uh, was that this is basically a life cycle thing. Uh, this started with the baby boomers, and when baby boomers get older, start raising their own families, don't worry. Um, if you're a church leader, they're going to be coming back because they're going to be having children, and they're going to want their children to be exposed to organized uh, Christianity. As we know, that's not what happened. And the thing is, is that the 2001 census really tipped us off um, that 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 was not a likely scenario because there are two trends that became pretty obvious when Stuart uh, first drilled down uh, in the into the results. One of them was that the no religion cohort, those who were saying, you know what, I don't have a religion, I'm not gonna identify with a religion, I'm gonna tick that box and say I don't have one. They said they were getting older. I mean, um, uh, the leading edge of the baby boomers, those born in 1946 and 2001, were reaching their mid fifties. And they were still, those were still identifying as having no religion. The other thing that was going on in this, it, 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 when that census was collected, is that not only were baby boomers persisting as self-identifying as have no religion, baby boomers were joining them in increasing numbers. So you can sort of see a flow through uh, from census to census. And that cohort, that baby boom cohort keeps getting bigger over time, that cohort that self-identifies as no religion. The other thing that became apparent, um, and this is just sort of triangulating the results of the census in 2001, is that it was very likely those baby boomers who self-identified as having no religion were very likely uh, bringing up their children as also having no religion. So when you put together those two demographic drivers, right, that the baby boom cohort who has no self-identifies with no religion is getting bigger. They're and they're being joined by children that they're raising have no religion. You end up having two really strong demographic drivers that grow the no religion category, uh, and the rate of growth is absolutely astounding. I mean, between 1961 and 2001, each decade you're looking at rates of growth for no religion. At, I think the lowest rate of growth was about one and a half times per decade. Um, the highest was almost twice multiplying two times over in a, a decade interval. Those are very, very strong growth trends and they're demographically driven. And that's really what launched us into the project that became um, the book Leading Christianity. Our goals were fairly modest. We really wanted to do was to find out four things. 
when do people start thinking about and actually leaving organized Christianity? Get a handle on that. Get a handle on the demographics. Who are these people? What's their background? What's their age, you know, age profile, ethnicity, so on and so forth. Thirdly, map out the scale and scope. How big is this trend? And finally, but fourth point, but last but not least, how durable is this trend? So that's basically what we try, tried to map out um, as we move forward with this project. And as Stuart points out, I point out in his comments, what we discovered is that the baseline of, uh, of affiliation as organized uh, Christianity entered into the 1960s was very, very strong. I remember a few years ago, visiting my wife's um, uh, old parish church in Sarnia, it was a church hall, one of the few church halls, I guess, in Sarnia that's still open, and it had a portrait gallery. <clears throat> and one of the portrait galleries that, one of the, portrait, one of the uh, photographs in the portrait gallery was in fact a photograph of my wife's Sunday school, circa 1960, 1961. That Sunday school was so large that they couldn't fit them all in the church to take a group photograph. They had to break them up into groups so they could capture uh, everyone that was involved in that Sunday school. So when people think about the early 60s, that organized Christianity really was vital. And that, as we know now, um, the decline uh, in Canada in terms of affiliation ended up being very, very strong uh, and very rapid. And I think that's what makes Canada a really interesting case study. If you look at European countries, there are significant portions of the population who had already disengaged and disaffiliated from organized Christianity before the 1960s. Uh, there were significant segments of populations in European countries that maybe were affiliated, but would have a very complicated and fraught relationship with organized Christianity, right? They might send their children, but parents themselves might not attend. That, those kinds of dynamics. In Canada, that's not the story. The story in Canada is, generally speaking, one of very strong affiliation uh, that's followed by rapid decline and massive decline. I mean, one of the things we discovered in this book is that the actual scale of disaffiliation from organized Christianity much, much larger than, well, and much larger than we thought it would be, and much larger, I think, than anyone else thought it would be. Not to put too fine a point on it, the category of normal religion is the proverbial tip of the iceberg much a very large tip granted but still a uh, proverbial tip of, of the iceberg and as i was saying i think this is what makes canada interesting is the scale and the rapidity of the of, of how of, of people dis of disaffiliation precipitous i think it would be the word that would come to mind so what we're looking at uh it seems to me is in effect a cultural revolution Canadians used to be a church-going people by and large church going and church affiliation was an important part of people's identity, it was an important part of their customs and practices. It's interwoven with wider uh, practices and customs. As Callum Brown points out, Sunday dinner being a classic example of that. Um, and in addition to being a part of their uh, identity, it was also an important part, an important source of their worldview and values. That clearly is no longer the case. And so what we're looking at is a massive change in culture. Um, probably one of the most rapid changes of, uh, of any country in the world. And that's what really drew us uh, to do this study in the first place. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I'm now going to move over here. Lori, you have a few comments you'd like to make. Ah, hi, everyone. Um, it's so terrific to see everyone. There are some advantages to this Zoom world, and that is that we can bring people together from all over the world to engage for a, a conversation like this. Uh, I really want to leave most of the comments to our panelists, but I did want to just emphasize how important I think this book is. As a, as a young sociologist, that was then, not now, um, I learned about so from sociology of religion, the dominant story was um, about 
Christianity um, being the majority religion, that you know any decline in numbers could be explained away by circulating saints or um, li- as uh, Brian has mentioned, life cycle. And I was fully prepared when I started reading Leaving Christianity because I, you know, I try to read whatever there is on religion in Canada. I started reading this book and honestly, I was fully prepared for another narrative like that. And then at page 12, I went, oh, and I read this. We do not regret the end of Christian dominance. And they argue that this this end has made possible diversity and tolerance. And they said, at which uh, they, meaning Brian and Stuart, which as Christians, we embrace. And I thought, wow, okay, now they had my attention. And I I read with even greater interest. Um, And what I think this book does, I think it's a game changer. It's absolutely a, a game changer. And I think the book lays the foundation for future research, for the research we're all engaged in, whether we're interested in religion or non-religion, it's an important book, an important documentation, an important retelling of the story. Um, it it gets a, get, it uh, does away with, pardon me, this the constant narrative of, oh, well, everyone's really coming back. Uh, certainly, they don't argue that Christianity is ending, but Brian and Stuart give a very realistic picture, and I am extremely grateful to them for that and for also raising the question of what happens in a society when this shift occurs. Now, we might differ a little bit, and I've talked to them a little bit about the social impact of this, the impact of the decline of Christianity, the increase of non-religion on things like charitable giving and volunteering, Um, but we can continue that conversation. And that's one of the wonderful things about working with and having conversations with with Brian and Stuart is that we can have these conversations in an open and frank way and continue to debate and discuss. So the panelists today, each panelist is a person I've had a conversation with about this book. Um, Peter Beyer, of course, is my longtime collaborator um, and co-investigator on non-religion in a complex future and friend as well. And I read the book and said, Peter, have you read this book? And so Peter's here today and he's going to talk about his comments. Callum, of course, has done some really important work on the historical bit, the why, why, what happened? And so Callum's been an incredibly important voice in helping to historically document the why. And then Christine and I, one of one of the moments when I realized how important this book was, was when Christine and I were at a board meeting together, and we happened to have a hallway conversation and, and uh, leaving Christianity is, of course, in in the book series that she's for which she's the editor. And, um, or the outgoing editor, I should say, now, but uh, was the editor then. And Christine and I, I said, Christine, that's an incredible book. And she said, I agree. It's mandatory reading in my classes. And I said, me too. And I thought, this is incredible. You have a sociologist who's interested in non-religion and a theologian who's interested in religion. And we both agree that this book is absolutely foundational to what, what interests each of us. And it was at that moment I thought, this, this book is doing something that hasn't been done yet in Canada. So without further ado, I'm, I'm going to pass, pass the, uh, the mic, if you will, over to our panelists today. And again, thank, thanks to uh, Stuart and Brian for, for doing the book and just for being incredible conversation partners, always, always generous, always willing to engage, um, and always willing to, to more fully explore the ideas you set out in the book, which I think is truly foundational. Great, thank you, Lori. Um, Yes, so we'll now hear from our panelists. And up first is Callum Brown. Right, (laughs) thank you very much, hello. Um, Very pleased to be here. Oh, for some reason, my notes have just disappeared. Oh, there they are. Um, By the way, timekeeper, do interrupt me uh, um, audibly because I can't see the chat because I've got my notes up. Thanks very much for asking me to do this. Um, Stuart, um, just to let you know, I haven't forgotten your first book, which I found on my shelf this evening. Unfortunately, um, your book with uh, Brian, is tr- uh, my copy of it is trapped in my university office, which uh, I haven't been able to get into since last February. So um, I'm having to um, make do with an online version. When I was investigating Canadian statistical data in 2011, 
the literature in the field was very far from satisfactory. And I'm, I'm going to name names. Um, it was kind of dominated by Reginald Bibby, um, whose approach to the decline of uh, evidence of decline of, of religion in Canada was to assume that it was cyclical, it was life cycle, as uh, Brian has said, um, uh, and was any, in any event bound to be reversed because religion was uh, absolutely intrinsic to the human condition. Um, if you go going to undertake study with that notion of an intrinsic place for religion um, in the human um, mind or psyche or whatever you want to call it, then I think you're tying your hands behind your back and disabling much of the analytical possibilities. For me, the most important thing that Stuart and Brian have done is to place Canada in the international social history of religion and secularization. I mean, for far too long, Canadian social history and sociology generally, right across the piece, has calibrated itself from the United States experience. And this book contributed to the growing trend of the last 25, 30 years of recalibrating towards the European world, by which I would define not just Europe, but also New Zealand, Australia, and many other parts as well, including, um, to some extent, South America now. The parallels between Canadian experience and that of many parts of Europe are phenomenally strong, including uh, Scotland, uh, another place which changed very quickly. Uh, Ireland, which everybody thought until 10 years ago, oh, piety is going to remain strong there. Just have a look at Ireland now. France, Netherlands and Nordic nations. Uh, I think there's a group of countries, on, and I would include New Zealand as well, um, where there was extremely fast change, again, dating from the 60s. So this book has brought Canada into the, the historian's gaze for the decline of Christendom in the West. Third point I, I would make is that the, the breadth of their study has been very important. Every denomination, with the exception of um, the Orthodox, um, are treated in considerable detail. And we get a, a really well-crafted narrative which brings out the individual experience of different denominations and groups and gives a, a great deal of space to uh, undermining the, the, the eternal verity that religious identity cannot shift. And again, I would refer to Ireland. Everybody thought, yeah, Ireland will be um, strongly Catholic forever. They didn't. And for those who st are still saying, ah, look at Poland, I would say, well, look at Ireland, because it used to be that Poland and Ireland uh, were mentioned in the same breath. The fourth thing I would point to is um, the focus on the people of no religion, chapter four of the book. Really good statistical analysis, um, looking at the characteristics of the age, um, the denominational background, who the, the non-religious are, including the gender uh, issue, which is well, well treated here. I'm one who has also found the gender equalization of nuns as a characteristic of all Western countries and issues in detail for Canada. So that um, only the United States has got a big gender difference left. And I'm sure that that's going to be eroded very rapidly in the next 20 years. Um, the last thing I would, I would point to um, one or two of the comments that um, Stuart has made. I agree. Um, I think social historians are needing to take more cognizance of the anti-communist campaigns in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, I, I, for one, have been discovering um, the Cold War and looking at the literature in the field of religion and the Cold War, which at the moment is dominated by a Christian approach, uh, which is rather unsatisfactory. Um, I think there's a need to look uh, at the whole area of um, Christian campaigning through the eyes of, if you like, of, of the nuns. I mean, I, th I think it's an important thing to look at those who dominate amongst the nuns now, who are mainly those under 30 years of age. And my experience of them, and there's very little research on this at the moment, my experience of them is that they are very different from the nuns who became nuns, um, say, 40, 50, 60 years ago. The nuns who are 
emerged since within the 1990s, almost invariably, who are never religious. Oh, and this so is a group. Yeah, and... right. Oh, give me 60 seconds. Sure. <laughs> um, the, 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 the type of individual who's never had a religion has not really been looked at by scholars. Perhaps there's somebody doing work on them, but certainly historians haven't looked at. And awareness of that type of person and their dominance amongst the, the, those under 30 really is a game changer. And I would suggest that all of us, sociologists and historians, need to start looking at, at them as the new normal. Thanks very much. Excellent, thank you, Callum. Um, and we'll now hear from Christine Mitchell. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the land on which I am currently sitting, the uh, territory of Treaty 6 and the homeland of the Métis. I'd like to thank uh, Laurie Beeman for inviting me to respond today. And I, I'd like to thank Brian and Stuart for writing the book. And I'd like to thank uh, Kyla Madden at McGill Queens University Press, who when we were launching this series that I am um, just concluding my term editing, uh, she said, we have this manuscript that um, is, is in the pipeline. And I think, and she said, I think it would be a great fit for the series to really get your series off to a good start. And absolutely, she was right. So I'm just so thrilled to have been a part of it at the uh, very latest stages. I have two points that I want to address. I want to talk about first, how as a biblical scholar, uh, the book has been uh, helpful in letting me grapple with um, what we might call biblical literacy in Canada. And then the second point I have is that how, as someone teaching in a United Church theological school, the book has been helpful to my students preparing for or already in United Church or Anglican Church ministry, because um, we also teach Anglican students. So as a, a biblical scholar, as a teaching assistant and a sessional lecturer in grad school in a mid-sized Ontario university in the 1990s, I could assume some basic biblical literacy um, uh, among my students. And this was also the case when I started teaching full-time in 2002 at St. Andrews here in Saskatoon. But um, this is no longer the case, um, especially with students in their 20s, which um, was interesting to hear um, from uh, Callum just now, um, and especially for Hebrew Bible, and I'm a Hebrew Bible scholar. And um, colleagues uh, who teach in secular universities uh, report the same, uh, sort of the very similar timing in terms of when we can identify uh, the period of time in which um, we don't have a basic biblical literacy among our students. Um, it definitely changes the dynamic of teaching. Uh, but more importantly, it changes how we attract, as biblical scholars, we attract students to our courses, whether it's in theological schools or in the secular, the public universities, because this book points out that this isn't going away. This isn't a life cycle thing. This is a long, uh, this is a going to be a long lasting societal shift, culture shift. But as a biblical scholar, we also need, whether we're in theological schools or in secular universities, to show the ongoing relevance of the Bible for Canadian cultural foundations, our laws, our public life, for example, the, ro the role of, of the Bible in, um, in the whole issue of Indian residential schools and um, the whole um, colonization of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And so I've done some work on the relationship of the Bible and the work of the TRC. So um, as a biblical scholar, it's important to grapple with um, this. So teaching at a United Church Theological School, of course, my students reflect the broader society. Um, so there's the same um, teaching issues in terms of changing the dynamic of teaching and attracting students to the courses, but preparing students for ministry in um, Christian denominations in this context has, of course, challenges. And so we now require all of our Master of Divinity students um, who are preparing for ordination to read this book. 
it's on the reading list for all of our other degrees and students in not in the United Church and Anglican Church also take these degrees. And what we're doing is we're educating students to educate congregations because that life cycle piece, that Reginald Bibby piece is so strong in the congregations. We're also educating students um, to think critically about all of these, what I call self-help books about the church, especially as many of them come from the United States. And as we've heard today, um, that uh, dynamic um, is just completely wrong for Canada, you know, trying to understand what's going on in Canada. So, tr so trying to educate students that once you're in ministry, don't go out and spend your money on all of these um, how to help your congregation thrive books that come from the United States. It's especially important in the prairie context here to note for my students that other Christian denominations are on the same curve as the uh, United Church and Anglican Church, which isn't the received wisdom out here. The received wisdom is that the, um, the uh, more evangelical churches are growing and thriving and they're doing fantastically and they are not. So uh, that's uh, something that's, uh, that this book really highlights. And so what I do is uh, in a course that I coordinate, I don't teach, I coordinate, um, uh, bringing together lots of people to help students think about uh, working in a local parish is um, getting students to think about what the church offers and how to tell people about it when we can't presume that they actually have, the people that they're talking to actually have any knowledge about uh, the church. And then a final anecdote. Uh, that uh, I'd like to say is that when I first started teaching at St. Andrews in 2002, there was a real resistance among the students who were mostly second career baby boomers to the idea of ever wearing a clergy collar. All of my younger students now who have graduated in the last 10 years, they all wear clergy collars. It's the uniform, it's what identifies them. They don't see it as oppressive. They see it as one way to, it's the one thing that people recognize from movies and other media um, as, oh, this is somebody who's clergy and they wear a clergy collar and some of them wear it all the time. And for United Church folks, the older, some of the older clergy, that's really weird, but it relates to these same trends. So I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to any discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and now we will hear from Peter Beyer. And just in time, my cat left. So, um, uh, you know, as being the third one, uh, one is the third one in these kinds of panels, one always says, will there be anything left to say by the time they get to me? Well, in this case, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, none of the things that um, I thought about saying have been said yet. So uh, I'm on good territory. <clears throat> now, the first line that I wrote here in my notes uh, to start off what I was gonna say, um, I guess I'm gonna have to revise it a bit given what's been said. That is, I, I wrote down probably the most complete analysis yet of what we've known for quite some time. Um, maybe I should, what, I've known for quite some time, um, but, um, or maybe what we've known for quite some time, but haven't quite come out and said as well as, as Stuart and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Brian have done. Um, but that's certainly the, you know, this is the impression that, uh, that I have with the book, probably because uh, in my own career, I've dealt a lot with the same stat statistics, especially from, from Census Canada that, that, that are so much at the heart of the book. Um, but, um, and, and, you know, in light of, um, uh, you know, the mentioning the necessary mentioning of Reg Bibby's work, uh, <clears throat> Reg has been saying the same thing since 1980s, but doesn't want to admit it. I still think he doesn't want to admit it. Um, uh, the fragmented gods in 1987 basically um, uh, said the same thing, or at least presented the same kind of data, and it's just gotten, as it were, more in that direction. Um, so I don't think this is a particular new story, but perhaps what is new is the uh, solidity uh, with which one can now uh, do this sort of analysis and come to the um, very convincing conclusions that this book has come to. And in that light, uh, one of the, um, uh, for me, most intriguing parts of the book is the section in the, um, 
no religion chapter on the Christian end. Uh, now, I know I, I've talked to Stuart and Brian about this. I mean, how long have you guys been working on the Christian ends? I think you said in the book, it's been quite some time. Um, and uh, uh, I know that you always uh, thought that the Christian ends were basically marginals. Um, and I think you've, you've uh, laid out a very, very good case for making that. And by the way, squeezing some uh, really good water out of a out of a out of a lifeless stone in terms of uh, the what you've been able to squeeze out of the available uh, statistics Canada data, um, I think that it's it's pretty convincing. And uh, and what I think it points to is that uh, in spite of or maybe perhaps in the context of these um, sudden rapid changes uh, that uh, the book uh, documents in part. Uh, the larger story is one of gradual shift. Um, the kind of thing of the gradual movement out and the gradual movement then of a loss of this part of the identity, then another part of the identity until you get to the point where one day um, you come across the Census Canada form and you say, you know, I'm going to stop pretending I'm not a member of the United Church of Canada anymore and I haven't been for 15 years. Uh, and so now you become someone who has no religion. I think the book documents that kind of um, uh, gradual process um, uh, really quite well. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it, it's that sort of thing that, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other literature um, um, in the Western world that is, is going very much in the same direction. Um, uh, I think of, for instance, uh, David Vos's uh, thesis about fuzzy fidelity, where he basically uh, argue is much the same sort of thing for uh, not just Canada, but many Western countries. Um, and that uh, um, what really has to be explained, if anything has to be explained in all this, is um, what what is going to happen from where we are right now. Um, I, admittedly, that's uh, a good part of what the NCF project is about, non-religion and con complex future. And is also a theme that this book brings up very, very solidly in several of its chapters, uh, arguing, I think, cogently um, that, uh, as has already been mentioned, that uh, that Reg Reggie Reggie Reggie's hope uh, that it was just temporary and it was a hope um, is not turning out to be the case. Although I suppose if we use the long enough timeline, uh, who knows what's going to happen fifty years from now. Um, the the other part of it that um, I, there, there are two parts, two more parts, I think I have a couple of minutes left that I just want to raise. Um, one is the, the vexed question of um, where are people going? Um, this is the, you know, sort of part of the Quo Vadis chapter. Uh, and um, the book does not really try to answer that. Uh, there's an awful lot of other uh, literature that is trying to answer that. Uh, except to say that it doesn't look like uh, they're going to back, go back to the old organizational forms very soon. And the other one uh, is an issue that um, is kind of really, it's kind of raised at the end that I just want to sort of throw out there because uh, I, I keep on coming across this. And this is people are less religious, there's more religious nuns, there's many, many more marginals. Um, and uh, one of the effects, symptoms, whatever you want to call it, of that is that people are volunteering less and um, supposedly giving less. And that's a problem. Um, uh, sort of like the religious organizations used to be responsible for doing all these wonderful things in society. Uh, and now that's no longer being done to nearly the same extent. So are we facing some kind of a societal problem um, more and more. And uh, I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's an important question, uh, but I would like to uh, see if we can throw that in with the, um, with the, the thesis that says that, you, you know, like Reg Bibby says, you just wait, this is cyclic is going to come back. Uh, uh, whether this um, decline in religious identity, along with decline in volunteering, a lot inclined with um, with uh, social engagement, along with decline in, um, in in charitable giving, as an example, whether this is really that much of a problem, uh, and whether it shouldn't be put under the same um, uh, title as 
what are people doing instead now when they're no longer identifying with the regiment? On that, I'll end. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, so we'll now move into the Q&A session of the webinar. Um, sorry, let me just spotlight my video. Here we go. Um, so if you have a question you'd like to ask, um, please just indicate this in the chat um, box, the chat function of Zoom. Um, you can even just write, I have a question, and then I can unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, alternatively, you can type out your question and I can read it out loud to everyone for you. Um, and we'll first start with Linda Woodhead. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I haven't read it yet, but it sounds fantastic. And it, it um, does seem to chime with what we know about the non-religious in the UK, uh, except for that, the, the fact that that's been growing over a longer period more steadily. Um, what I want to ask, I mean, all of you, I think, and the panel is, um, you made the point that this is uh, an enormous cultural shift. Um, if it is, why isn't there more interest in it? On, I mean, not just on the part of academics, but more generally, it's extremely under discussed and, and under noticed. And I wonder why, if it's such a big deal, why that should be. I might uh, take a quick stab at that. I think it's the story that nobody wants to tell from either side. Uh, I think um, religious people don't want to deal with that change or accept it. And I think there is a growing forgetfulness uh, of how religious Canada was, and even the UK. Um, so that would be my quick, my quick response. I'm interested. I think it's a great question. I'm interested in other responses. Well, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think it's um, also um, due to the fact that. In Canada, in, in my experience, <laughs> um, religion is something that's kind of rude to talk about. It's so if you don't talk about it because it's kind of rude, then um, then this is something that just this flies under the radar. I could add I, to that. I can, and, sorry, uh, after you, Peter. Okay, um, I mean. In, this, in the answer to the question, maybe this is this is actually part of the story. Um, it's, I mean, it's sort of like what what Stuart and, and Brian have said. It, it's not that Canadians, um, uh, for the most part, are against religion. I mean, some of them are, but it, it's a relatively small minority, uh, even in Quebec. Um, and um, it's just a more of like you know. I remember way back when, when I was a graduate student, I told a friend of mine that I was studying religion at the graduate level, and he says. What do you want to waste your time doing that for? Who cares, right? Um, it, and it's it, it's a kind of like um, yes, in Canada we don't talk about it, but the, you know, a symptomatic of the process is it's it's for it may be that for a lot of people, uh, a large portion of the population, it's simply not an important enough question to bother about. And of course, you know, the religious organizations and the churches and you know the religious people uh, who ask themselves, I mean. That, that in itself is, is a worry. I mean, how do we get you even interested, right? Uh, let alone um, when, you know, get you to actually come and as it were, try us out as it were, because see what we have to offer as it were. Um, so uh, it, it may simply be that um, it's, I mean, in, in some senses, um, I kind of, I, I can't take this whole thing personally because uh, um, I mean, I, my personal life is almost written in that book, right? Um, in, including is, you know, I don't remember the 60s, I was there. Um, and, uh, you know, having grown up in a church, uh, having been, uh, you know, gone to church during my youth, having been confirmed, and then at 15 years old, just never darkening the door of my church again, right? Uh, I'm a very typical story, and not passing on any religion to my children, and they're not passing anything on to theirs. Uh, so it, it's sort of kind of the personal story. And, and, and what I look back on is, it, is it's kind of, it's, there's something really unproblematic about it for those, I agree for, with for the people who go through it, right? But maybe not in a larger sense and, uh, and for, um, you know, others asking different kinds of questions. I agree with you totally, Peter. I was going to interject and just say, 
I think the under 30s, perhaps even uh, the majority of the under 40s, uh, certainly in Scotland, um, don't care about religion. Um, I, uh, I attract a significant number of students to uh, my atheist class, which I've been running in history of atheism um, for uh, now for four years, five years. And, and when they walk through the door, I ask, are you interested in religion? And they say, no, nope, completely bored. Um, and and it, it, their interest actually develops through discussing uh, their non-religion because they just don't imagine a world of religion. They, they've never had it. Their parents have never had a religion. Um, they may have they may have had some classes on religion at school, but in, in Scotland now it's it's uh, in the no, uh, non-Catholic schools it's turned into uh, RME religion and moral education. So the, the pure religious message that used to uh, pertain in Presbyterian schools in Scotland is gone, uh, perhaps with the exception of the, of the Outer Hebrides. But otherwise, um, the, we're in a new world, and I don't think um, I'm glad to see that Linda says there's there's a lot of work on. Uh, those with, who have never had a religion. I think um, the, fu the future for um, both historians and sociologists is to focus on that coming huge group. And I guess the same is going to be uh, the case in Canada. Great, thank you. Um, we'll now turn to um, Solange, who also has a question. Hi, everyone. So I'm Solange Lefebvre from uh, Montreal. Um, just a comment on the last question. I uh, would say that uh, there is a lot of interest for, th there has been for decades, but on related topics like non-religious philosophy or uh, alternative uh, discourse in uh, natural sciences or whatever. But what would be new maybe, because I thought about this when we started a project with Lori, what would be new is the interest in individual lives without religion. What do they do? What do they believe in? Or So it's just an hypothesis, but interest in non-religious or non-religion has been there for decades and even in a way for centuries. Uh, that, but my question to... Um, uh, Brian and Stewart. Well, thank you. It was very clear, very interesting. What do you do about Quebec uh, in a few words? Because what you're saying that would be so new about Canada has been told in Quebec. It's a narrative that has been told in Quebec for since the 70s. Uh, Martin Meunier, Warren did a lot of research on this. Uh, unfortunately, I think there, the, I know Brian <laughs> knows Quebec quite well, but uh, a few scholars in Canada do not read French. It's not your case, but uh, I know that a few books that started to even speak about the non-religious Quebec or less religious Quebec didn't even read the work that has uh, had been done in Quebec, but I, I know it's not your case. But what is said about Quebec is that is, it has been an exception in Canada in this regard you know, after the great rupture of the 60s. So how do you locate Quebec in your, in your book? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, Quebec really is a, a very interesting society to look at. Um, and uh, you're right. I mean, uh, there is extensive literature uh, done by Quebec scholars um, and we have benefited from that research. And, um, so if you compare that chapter, uh, that section of that chapter on Roman Catholicism to the rest of the book, I mean, indeed to the rest of the chapter on Catholicism in Canada, we're able to rely, in the case of Quebec, on an extensive body of literature, uh, which is not the case for the rest of Canada. Um, and I'm very grateful for that because uh, it, it's, it's a really interesting, um, it's a very interesting literature to engage with. Where I think Quebec stands, I mean, I think the, the comparison is Catholicism elsewhere in Canada. And uh, the contrast here is quite significant. In Quebec, I think you see, uh, uh, and the trends are much, much stronger in terms of, uh, of decline in attendance, but at the same time, uh, if you look at the census, people retain their identity 
as Catholics. I mean, I mean, no religion is is growing in Quebec, but it's still relatively small compared to the rest of the country. And I suspect probably smaller in terms of incidents um, for, uh, than Catholicism outside of uh, Quebec, although it's really hard to try to pin that down. Um, so I think that's what makes it as an, an interesting case study is that on the one hand, I mean, right now, what, Grosso Mondo, I think like maybe 40% of Quebecers never attend church at all. Probably one of the highest rates uh, in, in the country. Um, but you still have, um, if you look at how people respond to the census, what's your religion, they still self-identify as, as Catholics. One of the things I think will be happening, I don't usually bring out a crystal ball, but I, I think we are seeing this um, in the, maybe the past 10 years from 2001 to 2011, is that there probably is, not only in Quebec, but also in the rest of the country, a decline, small decline, but still a decline in how people self-identify. One of the things that happened right up until 2001, uh, and this is why it's, this surprised me, is that it appeared that Catholics uh, were continuing to self-identify. Even though people would not go to church, they still identify, self-identify as Catholics, not as no religion. One of the things I think that is happening now, uh, both in Quebec and uh, prob probably outside of Quebec as well among Catholics, is that persistence in identity is beginning to fade. Um, on what scale? Hard to say, um, but I think it is happening. And that's, I think, where Quebec is really going to be interesting. And you can contrast Quebec maybe with, um, say, Newfoundland where the change in religion, change in religious affiliation really dates, uh, well, post 1990s. Uh, Mount Kalsha, for example, had a major impact uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, and on the, on the standing of the Catholic Church in Newfoundland society, uh, to the extent that most Catholics were willing in a referendum to abolish their own school system. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left right now, so I just want to um, give this opportunity, Stuart or Brian, if you have any concluding comments that you just want to make. Um, otherwise, we'll, we can start to wrap this up. Excellent, okay. Um, and yes, I apologize. I see there's a couple more um, questions in the chat box, but perhaps um, we can continue this over email afterwards. Um, and so I'll just, yeah, conclude with some thank yous. Um, thank you so much to everyone who registered for this webinar, was here today and asking your questions. Um, big thank you to Callum, Christine, Peter. Um, thank you each of you for taking the time to be here today and um, all your meaningful contributions to our conversation. Um, last but not least, um, Bride and Stuart, thank you also for taking the time to be here today um, just to talk to us some more about your research and share your valuable insights into all the changes and shifts that are happening um, in Canada's religious landscape. So yeah, thank you everyone again and I hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>